Hey guys, JK Wargames. So today we're going to look at the first part of how to play The Last 100 Yards by GMT Games. So the first part of the game is who has initiative. So we're not going to look at setting up yet, we're just going to look at how the turn works. So usually one side has the initiative, so the mission will tell you the Americans have the initiative or the Germans have the initiative. So we're just saying for this mission, this demo, the Americans have the initiative. So we don't roll for initiative yet. So the first thing you do is roll on the coordination table. And this is to see if you can um, activate two platoons instead of one. So we roll a d10. We roll a one. Now we need a score of one to seven. Means we can only activate one platoon at a time. If we got 8 to 10, we could activate both platoons at the same time. So therefore, I can choose either to activate 2nd platoon or 1st platoon. So let's say we're going to activate 1st platoon. Now, they can either move or fire. And as the active player, we get up to 3 movement points. So let's just say we activate 1st platoon first. So this guy can move three, he's going to move to there. This guy's going to move into that building. And then these guys here, with the leader, are going to move up three. One, two, three. Like so. So that would be the first platoon activated. We can't activate that second platoon yet, so that's our actions done. Um, now, what we do next is call for reaction from the German player. So if we zoom out, we have the German players here. Now, when a, the defending player, the non-active player, he can only react to what the enemy does. And it has to be in line of sight. So this MG here can uh, react because he has line of sight to these guys. This unit here has line of sight here so he can react as well. These two units here do not have line of sight because this forest or woods blocks line of sight so these two units here at the moment only have an optional reaction which means they can withdraw or if they had a platoon leader with them they'd be able to react normally but they don't have a platoon leader with them. So let's say these guys react. So this MG is going to fire at the unit there. And this unit's going to fire as well. Okay, so let's say these two units have both reacted. They both shot at the uh, Americans that moved into line of sight. The Germans are not going to do an optional reaction with these. So they're going to call for reaction from the Americans. So the Americans have activated all of their first platoon, so they have nothing else to react with. So they call back to reaction. The Germans aren't going to react with anything else, so they call back to the Americans. The American player can now activate second platoon. So this first squad is going to go into the woods. Um, so when he moves, he goes into the woods this guy will move to here and this second platoon will not do anything we then call for reaction from the German player the German player still does not have line of sight here these two units have reacted so they can't do anything else these two units still don't have line of sight because this forest blocks line of sight if this American unit managed to get there on the edge of the woods this unit can now react, so they would fire at this unit. Then you'd call back to the Americans. So the Americans, because they didn't move this second unit here, or squad, they can only react with it. So when you activate a platoon, if you don't activate all squads or units in that platoon, that squad can only react. 
So let's just say we didn't activate this in our platoon activation. When the Germans call for our reaction, the only thing we've got left is this unit. We can only react. And we did have line of sight. You might have line of sight down to these guys down here, but that's how that works. So you activate your platoon, call for reaction, then the Germans call back or whoever calls back and then you activate your next platoon, etc, etc. So that's how the activation phase works. So let's have a look at firing. Okay, when a squad or unit decides to fire as part of its activation, um, we put down markers or small arms fires tokens or counters like this. Now how this works we take the unit or squad and we can see on the left hand side there they have a shoot attack value of 1 and they have a range of 8. So these guys are in this hex here and they are deciding to fire on the German unit that's just come out of the woods. So we count the hexes, we've got one, two, three hexes away. So their shoot attack value of one is modified. They are, you take their range, an eight, and for an eight, three hexes away is a minus one. So that one now goes to a zero. There's no other modifiers there. So this unit would gain a zero marker like that. Let's just say that the American unit were there and they wanted to fire on this unit. If a unit is within two hexes, you gain a plus one. So this one now goes to a two. There's no other modifiers, so a two marker would go onto that unit. So, they would gain a two marker. Now, let's just say the Americans have called for reaction. This unit would have activated. The Germans here witnessed that. They can react and they're gonna fire back. Now the Americans are within two hexes. So their one goes up to a two, but they have a small arms fire counter on them. So they are suppressed, so it goes down by one. So the two they did have, because of the enemy being within two hexes, goes down to one. So the Americans would have a one marker on them, like that. Now, if a unit fires at a unit in a building, let's find a unit in a building, here we go. This unit is in a wooden building. We're gonna say this MG here, it's down here. Now, for the MG, he has a longer range. So he has a range of 12 and he has a fire of one. So we're gonna count the hexes. Um, we're gonna say that they saw this unit, they moved within line of sight so he can react. So we count the hexes, one, two, three, four. Now they're four away with 12. I'm looking on the player aid chart you get for small arms fire modifiers. So uh, four hexes away with 12 is a minus one. So his firepower of one goes to a zero and a unit in a wooden building is a minus two. So it's gonna be a minus two modifier. So we had one, goes to zero for the range and then minus two for the building. So that squad receives a minus two marker. Like that. Now, if this unit here, the MG unit was in the woods, they gain a modifier from that. So the Americans are gonna fire back. They got one, two, three. So three with eight is minus one, so their one goes to a zero. It goes to minus one because they have 
a counter on them, they are suppressed. And it's another minus one because of the woods, the forest, which is a minus one. So we started at one, we go down to zero because of the range, we go to minus one because of the suppressed counter, and we go to minus two because of the woods or forest. So they receive a minus two. So you get the idea of how that works. Now there are other modifiers for shooting. So we have, um, if a hex contains a friendly vehicle, you would receive a minus one. If you had a regrouping marker on you, you receive a minus one. If a unit has a concealed um, marker on them, you receive another minus one. We'll look at concealed in a minute. So there are modifiers. That's all you have to remember with shooting is that there is always modifiers. So after the main activation phase is over and units are gonna take these counters through the whole sort of initiative and reaction phase, once both sides have completed, it's then the fire resolution phase. And how this works is we roll a dice for each marker and we add that much to the dice roll. So let's take the Germans here. They have a plus two. So we're gonna roll our dice and add two to it. I've rolled a five, plus two is seven. We look at the cohesion of the unit. So the cohesion of the unit is a six on the right here. So that would disrupt them, but our leader can bring that dice roll or total down by one. So the seven comes down to a six and the unit is fine. Okay, let's move on to the next unit here, the MG in the woods, he has a minus two. So we roll the dice and we take two off it. So we rolled a nine, that gives us a seven. The cohesion of the MG unit is a six, so he disrupts. Now when a unit disrupts, they're flipped to their other side. So, because we were higher than their cohesion, he disrupts. If it's lower, there's no effect. So he's disrupted. So now the Americans would roll. This unit here have a plus one. They roll a one, plus one is two. There's no effect, well underneath their cohesion. The guys in the building have a minus two. They rolled a nine. Minus two gives us seven, which is more than their cohesion. So they are disrupted. So they're flipped over like that. Now, when a unit is disrupted, if they have other units in the hex, for instance, let's say we had two squads in that building, this first unit disrupts, then any other units in the hex must perform a cohesion check. So he rolls a dice, he's rolled a six, equals his cohesion, so he's fine. If he had gone over that, he would have disrupted as well, but he passed but that unit there is disrupted. Now, very important, if a unit has a rolls a 10 or has a modified value to 10, they disrupt and they take a casualty. So let's just say we rolled an eight for this unit and he had plus two, that makes 10. He would flip, disrupted, and take a casualty. In the case of um, units like this, squads, not single units, squads, when they take a casualty, they are removed and replaced with a unit of the same type, but at random. So you can see they're one, and they're not as effective now, and they're placed there like that. A single step unit, when they take a casualty, are destroyed, removed from play. So that's how firing works. And then once you've done that, you move on to the next part of the turn. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at mortar fire next. Okay, so just to make that clear, guys, 
a single step unit like this, an MG unit or a light anti-tank weapon unit, are if they take a casualty, they're removed from play straight away. So we rolled eight plus two on his modifier is 10, that's a casualty, he's removed from play. He's a single step. Okay guys, so mortar fire. This infantry unit has line of sight down to the Germans here. As long as they are within four hexes of their platoon leader, then they can request more to fire. So the first thing we do is put our impact marker down. That goes on top of the unit. We then look on the mortar fire action table <clears throat> and for a 60 mil mortar for the Americans, their primary is a zero. So there's no modifiers because they are in an open hex, open terrain hex. So a zero goes on them. We then roll a dice to see where our secondary impact is going to land. So we roll a dice and it's an eight. Now if you score seven to ten, you get to place your secondary marker on the impact hex. So a minus one goes there because it's minus one for secondary. Now if we had rolled something else, so let's say we rolled a two, we look at the track down here, let me show you. You can see that two means it would land in the next hex. So it's gonna land here in the crossroads. So let's bring that back. So that would land there. And the other thing is our FO joins the unit there. So once we get to the fire resolution phase, the enemy would roll, etc. Then what happens is the FO can attempt to extend his mortar fire. Now on a roll of four or less, he can do that. So we rolled a seven, so we do not get that. So this FO marker goes on the game track in the mortar support pending box. And the impact marker is removed, but if he rolled four or less, he is flipped to his final side and the impact hex is left there. We then apply markers again, roll for the secondary marker, a three, which we now put this off to the side. And then the end of the turn would happen, but at the start of the turn, this unit's got this marker on them, they're affected in certain ways when they have an impact marker on them. So that's how mortars work, but when a mortar is in the mortar support pending box, you have to roll to try and recover. So let me show you how that works. Let me bring it over here. So you can see here, we've got an American and German FO counters in the mortar support pending. Now on a roll of four or less, they can move into the mortar support available. So let's roll for the American FO. We roll a one. So he now moves down to the mortar support available. The German rolls a five. He cannot, he stays there. So the Germans will not have their mortar available to them in the next turn, but the Americans do. And that's pretty much how that works. So it's, it's pretty simple, but effective. Now also, what we didn't look at is terrain and modifiers for mortar fire. So let's say the Germans were in this hex here. We had line of sight down to them. Let's say there, we had line of sight down to them. Now this is modified. What we get is the mortar fire DRM table. And we have air burst because there is woods. We get a plus one. So instead of our zero, we get a one marker. So let's grab a one. There it is. So it'd be a one marker because we've gained that modifier of air burst. Now, we'd roll again for the next one. 
Now it's a minus one for our secondary. We rolled a nine, so it's going to be on the same impact hex. Um, but it's a minus one, but it's modified to zero because of the airburst modifier. So we've got a zero and a one. Like that. So that's how mortars work. Now line of sight is targeted from the centre dot of the firing unit to the centre dot of the defending unit. So obviously if we drew a straight line through there, it would go straight through the woods. So that's blocking terrain. Also, if a unit was here and the Germans were here, this stone wall blocks line of sight. They can't, the Americans can't fire at the Germans and the Germans can't fire back. But if the Germans were up against the wall, adjacent to it, they can fire on the Americans. If the Americans are here, they can fire upon the Germans. Pretty simple. Let's look at units on different levels. So if this American unit is on this hill, now we know this is a hill because of the thick black line represents a hill and it's got a number one, so we're at level one. But in most missions, hills are, are gonna be times two or higher. So let's say this is times two. So we're on a two. This unit is over here. Now. The Americans want to fire at the Germans, but line of sight is blocked because this forest is a level two and also the hills at level two. So if we drew a straight line through the hexes, the line of sight is blocked because the hill and the forest are on the same level. Now, if this forest was a woods, lighter green, that's level one. So the Americans would stand a chance at firing at the Germans, but we'd have to use the blind hex procedure to do that. So on your player aid there is a blind hex table and what we have to do is take our two for the hill and then count the hexes to the intervening terrain. So we've got one, two, three, four, five. So the level difference if this was a one and we're at two is one. So we go one, two, three, four, five. So we look on one, go so we look on one, we go across to five, and it tells us that there's three blind hexes be behind the intervening or blocking terrain. So that's three blind hexes behind this. So it'd be one, two, three. So the American unit cannot fire at the Americans because of the blind hexes. So that is how line of sight works on different levels. Also, contour lines. This thinner black line is a contour. Now this is at ground level, but it blocks line of sight. It represents dips, little hills, etc. So this German unit, if they wanted to fire upon the Americans, they can't because if we run our line of sight, these contour lines block the line of sight. So the German unit would have to move into a better position to be able to fire on the Americans.